Hi, everyone. Welcome to At Katie Couric. Today, we're joined by a well-known bass guitarist. I'm sure you know his band, The Little Rockers. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee was a 2008 Republican presidential candidate, and he is a best-selling author. His new book, his seventh, is called A Simple Christmas. And Governor Huckabee, thank you. And I'd like to say thank you, first of all, to our sponsor, Dove, because we need our sponsors, don't we? We do need our sponsors. Without them, there is no, we are nothing. There is no show. <laughs> That's right. Well, nice to see you. And let's first start by talking a bit about your book, A Simple Christmas. Um, this sort of is trying to get back to what you believe Christmas is all about, not the commercialization, not the stress, not the overindulgence. And, and, and I think it dovetails rather well, I, not that I have the pulse of the country necessarily, but it seems that people have sort of reevaluated in the process of this economic turn, turn down. I mean, some people out of necessity because they have no choice, but other people, it seems priorities have somewhat shifted. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And, and that can be a good thing. Uh, a simple Christmas is about rediscovering what this holiday really should be. And it's not so much the what, the what I have, what I give, what I get, what I wear, what I eat. It's about who. It's about relationships. I asked somebody the other day, I said, can you tell me, think back, and this person is about my age, I'm 54, and I said, all right, look back and ask yourself, 50 years ago when you were four years old, can you tell me how much any of your gifts at Christmas cost? Can, can you tell me about it? No. Tell me a Christmas memory. And it was always about the people. It was, and if it was about a, a toy, it was not the price of the toy. It was the, the meaning of it. We're living in a very tough economy right now. More people out of work than have been out of work in a generation. Many American families, if not most, are going to be starting out with less money to spend on Christmas than they had last year or in many years. Some of them are going to say, this is going to be a terrible Christmas. No, it may be the best ever. And the stories that I tell in the book are stories that I hope some will be seen as funny. I hope some will be seen as touching. But the point being is that it gets down to that relationships with other people is what makes this is a very special time, and some of the stories involve uh, things like uh, the story of my wife having cancer. And, and when we came through that experience, we were 20 years old, been married just about a year, and first prognosis was she was not going to live. She had cancer in her spine, which is not a good place to get cancer. No. And they said if she lives, there's a good chance that we'll have to sever her spinal cord to remove the tumor that is inside the canal of her spine. So the best we can give you is that maybe we can save her life, but she'll be paraplegic. Now, we're 20 years old and newlywed. I'm in college. She's helping pay work and pay my way through school. We that was have no really parental... nice of her, by the way. Uh, yeah. And I was working full time. I was working 40 hours a week at a local radio station. And we were paying our own way, had no help from anyone. And then this hits. Well, it's devastating in every way. And it's not what you think you're going to be dealing with when you're 20. The Christmas from that, and after surgery and radiation therapy and her getting back on her feet, learning to walk again, and it was a, it was a tough year. But when we had Christmas that year, we, we had nothing. We didn't have enough to give each other anything. But you know what? It was the best Christmas we ever had. We had life. We had each other. And Christmas took on a whole new meaning. And so I, I would tell people that sometimes the worst experiences externally turn it into the moments in which we say uh, life can be tough, but next Christmas it's going to be better. And it gives us a point of reference to move from. You talk about uh, the guitar you received when yeah. you were four years old that your parents bought from the J.C. Penney catalog, and they had to sacrifice so much right. just to get you that dang guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pretty obstinate. I said, the guitar or nothing. And looking back, they should have given me nothing. I mean, that was a rotten thing for a kid to say. But I wanted it. I mean, the Beatles had come out, and I wanted the guitar. I, I didn't really want anything else. Uh, th this was actually when I was four, and that was my dad's old cowboy guitar. I wanted an electric guitar, and I got the electric guitar when I was 11. Oh, so the, do, you 11. write about the electric guitar yeah, yeah, versus yeah. this one. Yes. But they ordered it from the J.C. Penney catalog. It cost $99, and... They really couldn't afford it, and I didn't know that. I mean, heck, when you're 11, what do you do? Go ask your parents, can I see your 1040 forms? Let me see how much guys, how much money you guys make. So as a result, I, I just demanded that's what I wanted. Well, they ordered it. It took them a year to pay for it. They paid a little bit each month over a course of a year to pay off 99 bucks. But that guitar was transformational. It changed my life. 
I was a bashful, shy little kid that would not get in front of anybody. And playing that guitar and getting to the place where I got more comfortable in front of other people, um, I opened doors that do you think I'd ever run for any public office or gone on television or anything like that? Of course not. That guitar was more than just the music, which in and of itself was a powerful part of my life and still is. But it was all that it represented. And so sometimes we forget that it's that gift that may not have this huge dollar value, but it may change a person's life because of what it represents and what it puts in a person's hands. Well, it sure did the trick and then some, Governor. Yeah. <laughs> if I could just get a permanent gig. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell people, Katie, you know, if, if I could uh, get a full-time gig with a rock band, I'd grow hair down to my rear end, tattoo myself, get pierced, and get on the bus tomorrow. Can you believe that that's really what I always wanted to do? <laughs> I, I, do you have to have all the accoutrements? I think uh, you could do it without the piercings. You, you think, I don't know. It just doesn't you really just, work look, for does you. This, but this just doesn't <laughs> hardly look like the uniform of... Uh, that's of a true. Rock musician. That's true. Well, let me ask you a little bit, obviously, about politics. Sure. Because um, there are interesting times going on politically. And in a recent Gallup poll, 71% of Republicans say, say they would seriously consider voting for you. That was higher than Mitt Romney or Sarah Palin. They each had 65%. And the same thing in a CNN poll, you were first among Republicans. Who do you think are the Republicans with the biggest political futures, if you had to say now? Well, today? first of all, I wonder where were those people three years ago when I really could have used them. Um, I think the Republicans right now are not so much sorting through who's going to lead. We've got to come to grips with what we're going to stand for. And the Republicans got in trouble because they abandoned the very principles that are supposedly Republican. Controlling spending, keeping taxes low, accountability, uh, a sense of... Uh, of simply doing what you say. Well, the Republicans spent money is bad, if not worse, than Democrats. The Republicans sponsored the TARP bill, which really began the whole series of mass bailouts. Uh, people really found that offensive, Republicans especially. The Republicans have been responsible for centralizing more power and control at the federal level and within the executive branch. Uh, a direct defiance to the concept of the best government being the most local government because it's accountable to the people who are being governed. Those are all bedrock Republican things that have been abandoned by Republicans over the past few years. So the first thing that has to happen is the what. I think the who could be a number of people and, and certainly the, the people that are being polled, whether it's uh, Mitt Romney, Sarah Palin, uh, are all people who I, I think have a very significant future. But, but I think there's some names that you haven't heard. People like Marco Rubio in Florida. Uh, I think he'll be a Republican contender for president someday. And he's that unknown uh, presence, uh, running against Charlie Crist uh, as the underdog down there. I, I see some exciting, bright, young, uh, articulate, and charismatic people coming up in our party. Who else? Um, Tim Pawlenty. What think, do you think uh, of him? I like Tim. Tim's very Governor sharp. Governor of Minnesota. We I, I think out. he's got uh, potential. I think Mitch Daniels. Uh, you know, Mitch, I'm, I'm not saying he's a young, but he is brilliant and has done a phenomenal job of leading Indiana. Um, Haley Barber is another person who is an old hand at politics, probably the best political strategist in the country. So we, we've got a number of people that could step in. You talk about sort of the Republican Party abandoning some of its principles, but the other criticism of the Republican Party is it's become too extreme and and that you can't win without the base, but you can't yeah. win with just the base, that you have to make it more broadly appealing to a larger number of people and, quite frankly, the changing demographics of this country. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? How do you make the Republican Party look like a, a party that many, many people would want to join, not just those on the far right? I, I don't think it's a matter of being on the far right, but the Republicans have to... Uh, coalesce around someone who does have bedrock conservative principles. If you go back to 1976 and every presidential year, when the Republicans nominate a, a genuine conservative who doesn't just espouse it but practices it, the Republican wins. When the Republicans nominate somebody who tends to be more moderate, the Republicans lose. That was true of, of uh, Ford in 76, Reagan in 80. Uh, and at 84. But what about George Herbert Walker Bush? I mean, he's he, not he really... He ran as a conservative in 88, but by 92, he had promised, read my lips, no new taxes. Then he raised them, and, and he was ousted. And the dynamics of that race 
in addition to the tax increase, which caused a lot of Republicans to go vote for Ross Perot, the presence of the third party created a spoiler. And so there was never a majority received by any of the candidates, but Bill Clinton had the plurality and became president. What, what about you? Do you think you'll give it a go again? I mean, the honest answer, and everybody assumes that I'm just sitting around plotting my comeback, uh, but I don't know. And, and be honest with you, I'm having a wonderful time. Life is good right now. I but love doing my show. But certainly you must have some inkling of, of what you want to do. You've experienced running. Yeah. You were in the primaries. You seem That's to enjoy it. That's why I'm not as it. eager to do it again. <laughs> really? I mean, is it is is that was your last experience a real turnoff? One and if the, so, why? It's not a turnoff. No, I was energized by it. I loved it. If the campaign were about issues, if it were really going out and talking to people about dealing with health care and education and the transportation infrastructure of this country and uh, securing borders and, and how, how we can more strategically place the U.S. in the world, I would love to be involved. But, you know, sadly, running for president is mostly two things. It's raising an obscene amount of money. And secondly, it's defending yourself against these ridiculous attacks from all sides some of which come from opponents, but a lot of them come from the trees out there in the world of cyberspace where you can't even identify who's shooting at you. Um, and if you don't respond to them, then, then people they, can cook your, right, yeah. they can cook your goose, like exactly. John Kerry with swift boating, for exactly. example. You have to answer the stuff, but then you have to have the money to be able to answer the stuff. Uh, I, I worry that our system is getting totally off course in the election process. It's too early for us to be looking at 2012. But we're already discussing it. And what happens, we're moving to the place where the only people who can really run for office are the people who have vast amounts of personal wealth or who have enough friends who have vast amounts of personal wealth that they can finance a campaign. And secondly, can they go without an income for two years or longer while they do nothing but run for president. Let me ask you uh, about the standing ovation you got at Brown University. Yeah. Not exactly Bob Jones. Not exactly. Uh, no. Joe Behar, Joy Behar called you her favorite Republican. Mm -hmm. And uh, A.J. Jacobs wrote in Esquire that the liberal media just wants to hug you. <laughs> I don't know if he speaks for everyone. No offense, Governor. But yeah, how so does an anti-abortion pro-gun guy like you get that kind of love from the left? Well, it bothers a lot of people on the right that I'm not as hated by the left, but I think the point is I believe that, that adults can have a civil conversation and have even stark disagreement on issues without yelling, screaming, and interrupting each other's sentences. And But that seems to be less and less frequent. It does, and it troubles me, and it may be why uh, I never have a platform to run for president, and it's just a reality I've got to face. There is a certain number of people who like conflict, and they don't like resolution, they like conflict. I like resolution. I was a governor for ten and a half years. I wanted to solve problems, not just scream about what they were. We had to make the, the roads better. We had to create better schools. I think most people who are governors tend to be people who are focused on the resolution rather than simply the combat. If a person has a legislative background or a legislative mindset, the game itself is the process, not the product. And I think it, it, it's a big difference in how we uh, approach the job. Speaking of game, we're going to play the name game real quickly. Okay. And I'm going to say some names and you just give me a sentence or two. Career enders, right? <laughs> Things that just pop out of my head and I say, oh, why did I do that? Yeah. I can see this coming. Yeah, that, that's here our go. goal here. Yeah. All right, Mitt Romney. Uh, intelligent. That's it? That's fine. Oh, is it just one word or whatever? No, you can you can do a oh, sentence. Oh, elaborate? No, you don't have. I mean, it's it's whatever comes to mind. If well, one word I mean, comes to Mitt mind, Mitt Romney. The biggest problem Mitt Romney has, if he'd have been Mitt Romney in the election, I think he would have been very difficult to beat. Mitt Romney was always looking for who he was wanting to be in the primary, and I think it was uh, not he was not well served by that. So he changed his positions too often, in your view. Well, yeah, and you weren't sure what he really absolutely thought was his greatest asset. Bring your best game to the table and play that game. And if you don't have a game on some other areas, just say, that's not my thing. Bobby Jindal. Uh, brilliant young man. And I think he is a great governor. Uh, he is one I should have mentioned in the uh, Rising Stars. That was an unfortunate appearance at the, when he did the Republican rebuttal it at was the State not of the Union. Moment. Because I think it, it, it sort of detracted from his, his bona fides, if you will. Well, and part of what happened was the staging. Whoever said, let's have you walk out like you're coming out of, of the hall to the East Room. Yeah. 
uh, after President Obama just pledged to 535 members of Congress, the Supreme Court, the Cabinet, and all of America. I mean, it was just a hideously it bad was idea. It was actually, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. But on that, I don't know who it was who thought that that was a great idea to stage it like that, but they should be summarily shot. Just taken out and summarily shot. Okay, can, all yeah. right. Gee, don't want to Now I'm going to probably off. be arrested. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, you mentioned Tim Pawlenty already. Mm -hmm. Mark Sanford. Uh, tragic story. I know Mark very well. That was a story that totally caught me off guard. And my heart goes out to Jenny, who is a lovely, lovely lady. The whole and, thing was so embarrassing. And strange and sordid and bizarre. It just, out of character. I, I totally was unprepared for that. Sarah Palin. Uh, I think a very charismatic person who is rock star status in the Republican Party. Um, and she'll have to decide, does she want to channel that energy that she brings to an electoral process or in some other way? And, and I, don't, I don't know where she's headed with that. In a recent CBS News poll, 62% said Sarah Palin would not have the ability to be an effective president. In the CNN poll, it was higher, 71% saying she's not qualified. Do you agree or disagree with that? Well, I disagree. I mean, she did have executive experience. She, she was a governor. Um, uh, I don't know that much about her job as governor because she was coming into office as I was leaving. And so we didn't have a lot of crossover time where we interacted at the National Governors Association or Republican Governors Association. Uh, but I think that she's not anywhere near the person that sometimes she's been portrayed to be as is completely lacking of, of any intellectual capacity. Uh, Real Talk B. Lewis on Twitter. That's his screen name. We might call it in <laughs> Arkansas, where I'm from, Virginia, his handle. Uh huh. I know what a handle <laughs> means. <laughs> Would Huckabee vote for Palin? Uh, you know, against Obama? Absolutely. You know, in the primary, it would depend on who else was running. But would I vote for her? You know, first of all, she has more management experience and executive experience than Barack Obama. I feel one of his biggest weaknesses is the lack of having been at a desk where he personally and he singularly had to make a decision and had to do it right now. New York's 23rd Congressional District ended up being a very interesting case study. And I think sort of we discussed this really when we talked about the future of the Republican Party. But conservative Republicans attacking a moderate Republican and eventually she withdrew from the race endorsed the Democrat, as you know. And, and this question, it seems to me, has dogged the party since Lee Atwater, you know, during mm -hmm. the Reagan years, was saying, we need to have a big tent. We need to embrace more people. And I guess we've really already addressed this, Governor, but is there any any way, any other things that you can think of that, that would help achieve that big tent strategy? Or is that something the Republicans shouldn't strive for? Well, if big tent means that there's room for people who don't necessarily agree with everything, that's absolutely the case. If the tent has holes in the ceiling because we don't stand for anything at all, that's not good either. Let me give an example of something the Republicans have got to do. We've got to do a better job of reaching out to minorities, be they African American or Hispanics. Hispanics, fastest growing demographic group in America. If we alienate the Hispanics over the next generation, we are preparing ourselves for extinction. Simple as that. Hispanics would naturally be Republican. Hispanics overwhelmingly are pro-life because many of them are strong, staunch Catholics, and very pro-life out of deep conviction. Hispanics tend to be very, very industrious and believe very strongly in the individual work ethic, personal responsibility, don't want government handouts, had rather be able to work. Great Republicans, they really are. The Republicans have got to find a way to articulate how to deal with the immigration issue that puts the burden on the government and doesn't make it look like that you're uh, taking cheap shots at people who come to this country for the same reason that my ancestors or your ancestors did. I always said we ought to get on our knees every night and thank God we're in a country that people are trying to break into, not when they're trying to break out of. But the real fault in this whole immigration debate has been that our government has done a miserable job of making it so that a person who just wanted to come here and work could have a reasonably simple method of getting to this country, working, raising a family, 
and that it wouldn't be easier to break the law than it would be to try to comply and spend 18 years trying to keep work permits and eventually get citizenship. How is your vision for America different than President Obama's? Well, for one thing, I think that America needs to never apologize for its strength. We should never look back and try to say, well, we did this wrong. It's okay to acknowledge that we've made mistakes because we have as a nation. But there are several things that, that I'm very concerned about. One is debt and deficit spending. I think that we are creating a situation unlike any, even when we have amassed debt. And George Bush amassed a lot of debt. So let's not just say it was all Barack Obama because George Bush bragged that he never raised taxes, which that's great, but he never balanced the budget either. So you've got to realize that just saying you didn't raise taxes if you ran up huge debt and deficit and kicked the can down the road for the kids of the country is not really great management. I worry about it because I feel that this is the first generation in which we have done the polar opposite of our parents' generation. Tom Brokaw called them the greatest generation quite accurately. They were willing to make any sacrifice to lift their kids to a higher level of life than they'd ever lived. We're the generation that, for the most part, has said, so we've recklessly managed the economy, so we've created these manipulative games on Wall Street that are built on greed and have destroyed what once were great companies, and now people have lost their pensions and their paychecks. Well, by golly, we don't want to pay for it, so let's push that burden on the next generation. Now, I come from a world when if I'd broken my arm as a child, my parents would have said, son, I'll break both my arms if I could take that broken arm from you. And they really meant it. It's almost as if we're saying to our kids, we don't want to experience the pain of a broken arm. We're going to break both yours instead. I really worry that we are pushing the, the burdens, the pain, the consequences of reckless actions of government on the next generation. Having said that, he did inherit a huge deficit and a world of problems, and I think you would agree with that. He inherited it, but he's, he's only made it worse. He inherited a deficit of $6 trillion. We now have one of 12. The $787 billion stimulus has not stimulated a whole lot except, uh, I think, some government jobs. Now we find out that there are 440 non-existent phantom congressional districts that are supposedly reporting job creations or job saves. They don't even exist. Uh, that's been scandalous. Our unemployment numbers were never supposed to get above 8% if we passed the porculus bill. It, it's now rising above 102 and climbing. That's not what it was supposed to, uh, to do. What would your approach then have been if you had been elected and you had in inherited the economy that <laughs> he inherited? Yeah. What do you think you would have done? What measures you would you have taken that you believe the economy would be in much better shape today? Well, first thing I'd have done is, is to stop and, and at least curtail spending. Uh, if a family gets in trouble and they're going through financial difficulties, the first thing they know is they've got to cut back. They may have to cut back cable TV, trips to the movie, vacations. Uh, they eat out less often. That's what people do. The government has taken the opposite tack. We're in trouble. We spent more money than we had, we borrowed more money than we can pay back, so what do we do? We spend more money and we borrow even more. And now we're so in debt to the Chinese that they're getting nervous that we're going to default on them. I mean, that's pretty sad when the Chinese say, you might ought to rethink that health care policy because we're not sure you guys can afford it. When the Chinese, our banker, now sits us down across the desk and tells us not to go do that because they're afraid we're going to leave them high and dry as well as ourselves. That's not the America of strength that we should have. Having said that, and I'm not an economist, but when you hear government officials, Republicans and Democrats alike, saying that we have to bail out these major financial institutions or it will be catastrophic mm. for the economy and we have to do this painful thing or it will be much more painful. Right. And uh, you have Warren Buffett saying that as yeah. well. Um, you know, a lot of Americans think, okay, well, we've got to avoid an absolute catastrophe, and this is sort of the medicine that we have to take for now. Well, it's like we have taken this medicine, but we may have passed on a carrier gene to the next generation that will be a far worse disease than the one we would have had. I hear people talk about the catastrophic results if we hadn't have done TARP. Oh, we saved the day. And I remember Hank Paulson going out there, you know, pouring sweat, wringing his hands, and even the president saying, oh, we don't really want to do this. This is not the ideal, but we've got to do it. Well, it turns out as we look back, we're not sure that we had to do it. 
I, I know there are people who say we we don't know. But what do you one, think? What do you think could have been done that would have saved uh, the financial institutions or kept others from? Folding I'm not sure like that Lehman. that's the purpose of government is to save companies that have been recklessly mismanaged. And I'm going to take a, a rather bold position here. When people screw up, if they don't suffer the consequences for it, they continue to do the screw up. You think GM should have just not had any kind of government assistance? It would assistance? break my heart. I've owned GM products for 35 years exclusively. But do you, I, I'm a would GM you be customer. fine with GM going? Just I would be fine with a company suffering the, the just rewards of reckless, irresponsible policies that they should have corrected. When you have boards of directors who don't manage properly, the question is, is it the job of government to intervene in the game so as to choose the outcome? My point would be this. If I watch football and one of the referees starts making calls that affects the outcome of the game, I'm thinking that guy in the striped shirt might as well put on the team jersey. It is not the job of the striped shirt to determine the outcome. It is his job simply to make sure that the game is being played fairly. And if somebody loses, they lose. The purpose so you're of more government, libertarian in a way on, well, on that point. Well, I think point. that's classic Americanism. I, I wouldn't. I'm not a libertarian. I, I think government has a role and a, and a responsible one. I'm not an anti-government guy. That's why some of the people don't like me because I think there is a role for government. And I think government has a role to play in uh, even helping people who are helpless and providing health insurance for people who are uninsurable, not just the uninsured but the uninsurable. Government should What's build roads. What's the difference, roads. I'm sorry, between the Some uninsurable people are uninsurable uninsured. because they have... Uh, chronic disease or they have pre-existing conditions or they have maybe um, developmental disabilities and they're uninsurable in the classic form of actuarial based insurance. But there are other people who are uninsured because they just rather buy a truck or buy a stereo than they had to pay for health insurance. I don't think it's the job of taxpayers to to prop up people who make dumb choices. I think it is the, the responsibility of all of us as citizens to realize that but by the grace of God, there go I, and it might be me with that developmental disability. Let's make a way that that person can be included in getting health care. Lamar Alexander, as you know, yesterday said that the Senate bill on health care reform was a turkey, and the turkey's not going to taste any better in November. What is to, to mix our proteins? What's mm -hmm. your biggest beef <laughs> about uh, the current health care bills on Capitol Hill? And I, I, we don't want to yeah. get in too too much detail, but what what's wrong with it in your view? Well, one of the because things... Because most people do want a public option, Governor, as you know. Well, I'm not sure... At least according to polls. Some polls indicate that, but I don't know that people fully understand what a public option means. It does mean that over time, people will be forced into that option because private insurance can't compete if they're trying to compete with an entity that is being highly subsidized. There, there are several problems, and I'll try to get to some of the big ones quickly. Why can't private insurers, insurance companies compete by maybe lowering their prices so they can be more competitive? You know, it's interesting because private insurances are less likely to deny coverage than Medicare. Medicare, the government-run option, has twice as many denial of claims as does the next private insurance company. I'm not defending insurance companies because sometimes they do some really heartless things. I mean, they can be cruel. And I've experienced it firsthand, so I, I'm not out there saying, oh, they're wonderful and they're just all about being compassionate. But the government is not exactly uh, getting A pluses for their administration of health care. Uh, I thought that it was outrageous when this government panel this week came out and suggested that women not get the mammograms every year. That could result in a lot of women dying. But specifically back to the health uh, bill in the Senate. First of all, you're paying for something for three years before you get the benefits. It's the equivalent of paying rent on a house for three years before they let you move in. Uh, that's the way that they game this whole plan into making it appear that it's paying for itself. It isn't. They claim that there's going to be these enormous savings in Medicare. There's only one way that you can really create savings when you have a baby boom population, that 10,000 baby boomers a day are retiring. You're moving more people into that population, and you're going to it's going to cost less even when medical costs go up. I mean, that's not uh, good government. That's magic. And that's not going to happen. We're, we need to quit kidding ourselves. I, I think that this is an attempt to have a political bill rather than something that attacks the fundamental problem in America, which is not health care, it's health. Because 80% of the cost that we spend, $2.4 trillion on health care, is chronic disease. Chronic disease is driving the health care cost in this country. 
and that's primarily overeating, under-exercising, and smoking. If we're really serious about bringing costs down, you've got to bring the quality of life, the health of the Americans up. In fact, that became a real issue for you when you yes. were governor because you, you lost a lot of weight. You right. started running. I think you ran a marathon. Four in fact. of them. Four marathons. Yeah. Impressive. Give me credit for all okay, four. Okay, sorry, gosh. sorry. That's tough, um, tough. <laughs> but, but I'm curious, um, how much pressure do you feel about maintaining your weight given that you, yeah. you personally focus so much attention on it? Well, I think it's important you know, to, to maintain good health. And, and this year has been a tough year for me because of some foot issues with plantar fasciitis, which every runner will identify with. Um, but I think I've got to be responsible for my health. You know, one thing about it, when, when I've maintained and I've never had any, you know, medication for diabetes for six and a half years once I took control, uh, my blood sugar is still good. I still exercise regularly. And what I find is that my health care costs are dramatically lower today than they were several years ago because blood sugar, cholesterol, uh, respiration rate, uh, those basic clinical factors are in better shape than they were. Let me, um, you know, you were talking about your different vision from, from President Obama, right. but, but recently you were critical, uh, or actually you, you said you deplored, you were critical of some of your fellow Republicans. Yeah. You said I de you deplored knee-jerk criticism of Barack Obama. Gee, I can't see anything without my glasses <laughs> anymore, sorry. Citing some attacks from the right after his trip to Dover mm -hmm. Air Force Base. Were you referring to anyone specific? Because I know Rush Limbaugh had criticized President Obama the, the day before you made that well, statement. Well, there were no one in particular. I wasn't criticizing Rush. He's got a bigger megaphone and microphone than I do, and I'm not going to get into a war with him. It wasn't about Rush Limbaugh. It was about the general tenor. I read editorials. I heard people on commentary shows. And even when the president went to Dover and stood there with reverence at the caskets of our American soldiers coming back from Afghanistan, I was grateful for that. You know, I don't have to agree with him on a lot of policy, but Katie, he's the commander in chief. He's the president of the United States, and I want to respect him as that president. And I think I can argue with him on policy without dismissing everything he does and questioning its motive. And the reason it made me upset was that during the time that George Bush was in office, there were people who everything the man did, they criticized. He couldn't do a thing. He couldn't even tell a joke that they would think was funny. Well, we can't have it both ways. It's hip hypocritical for us then to turn around and to question every motive of Barack Obama. I mean, trick-or-treating with uh, the kids at the White House, that was wonderful. I was glad he did that. And there were people who were excoriating him over that. It's ridiculous. What about bowing before the, uh, Japan's emperor? You kind of were I excoriating that him I over did. that. I did. But because why? Well, because I think that as a private citizen, for him to bow and show uh, deference and respect is one thing. But as the President of the United States, uh, it's not appropriate to, to bow to foreign leaders because he's representing the country. I, I just think back... Isn't he just following custom, though? I mean, I mean to me, this whole debate, mm -hmm. quite frankly, is, is exactly what you were saying you deplore. You know, President Bush got vilified because he held hands, right. remember, down in I Crawford do. with right. Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. And, and, you know, do we really want to waste time? Isn't sometimes a bow just a bow for crying out loud? Well, I mean, a, a slight I mean, it doesn't, seem, curtsy, it doesn't seem characteristic of you to I just thought to that that deep bow it. to the waist to the Japanese emperor was symbolic of, of saying we're, we're deferring. It's not merely a, a custom and a greeting. By the I, I way, was, do you want to know in a Fox News poll, 53% of Republicans said it is okay to bow when it's customary. What was it, too deep? I, no, it was just that the whole picture of the president of the United States in that capacity bowing w was offensive to me. But you know that what? That seems I could beneath be wrong. you to me. Oh, I don't think so. I think it's just – but but I will defend him on other things. For example, I, I think that his, his carrying out of his private life has been exemplary. I, I'm grateful that he's shown us really to be a good husband and a good father, and I've, I've been very complimentary on that. It's the policy issues that I'm going to disagree with. But even even I could be wrong. I think that that was inappropriate. I still do, no matter what the polls show. Well, I show. think you used it to say it was emblematic of a redistribution of power and, and 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 bending over backwards, if you want right. to kind of uh, sort of expand well, the, the metaphor to to people around the world. And and but at the same time, while yeah. you criticize that, what's wrong with other nations having a better better view of the United States than they did during the Bush administration? Well, I think it's great that they have a better view. I'm not sure that, that we've gotten there yet. 
Um, According I mean, to we, a lot of polls, to... though, as you know, you know the 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 view of the United States has has increased in a positive way uh, when it comes to various nations around the world. It hasn't worked out in policy. You have people in Eastern Europe that are very unhappy with the U.S. for dismantling the missile system. You have Angela Merkel who says, uh, excuse me, Mr. President, or the Angela. United States. <laughs> we're not going to go there in terms of, of changing our economy and raising taxes right now. It's the wrong direction for Europe. Uh, the North Koreans haven't exactly capitulated and said, you know what, we're going to stop this nuclear testing that we've been working on. The Iranians certainly haven't come around. In fact, they're now saying they're not even going to allow the inspection of, of their enriched uranium. So it's not working out real well for us yet uh, as far as practice. Now, they may say, oh, we are so much more respectful. I like respect when it's shown, not when it's stated. And I'd rather have people dislike us and fear us and respect us than I had for people to like us. But what it really means is they don't fear us and they don't respect us. I have uh, so many more questions, but not a ton more time. So I'm trying to figure out which ones. I, you know, <laughs> Shall the, I pick them You out? know this problem. No, that's okay. I, I can do it on my I own. Thank you, Governor. Of, what about the Tea Party movement? Um, what do you think of that? Uh, I think and, it's very positive. Uh, and, and I believe that it was totally misread by people like Nancy Pelosi, who, who contemptuously called that movement AstroTurf. And I thought that was... Uh, unfortunate, and if anything, it's going to come back to bite her because I know a lot of the people who are involved, uh, they're not necessarily Republicans. In fact, a lot of these people are just as mad at the Republicans. What I fear of the Tea Party movement is it could end up being a third party. If it is, it will have more uh, empowerment or, or will create more empowerment for Democrats than Republicans. It will split what typically is Republican slash libertarian slash conservatives and give the Democrats almost a clean shot to uh, whatever race they're running in. Friday 42 on Twitter asks, why are Republicans so angry? Well, and I think maybe are. if we're talking about the Tea Party movement, yeah. those aren't just Republicans, aren't Republicans or they're not people who are just angry at those Republicans. Those are middle class working people and they're small business owners. And they're angry because they can't keep going like they're going. They can't get credit from the banks to put a floor plan in, floor plan being their inventory and stocking their stores. They don't know what their taxes are going to be. Uh, they're being classified as rich because they may be a sub, -check, uh, a sub S, a sub uh, corporation, yet their total assets may be a million dollars. They're not personally keeping a million dollars, but they're going to fall into this tax system of, quote, the rich, and they're nowhere near rich. Uh, they're nervous. They're nervous that cap and trade could double their utility bills. They can't survive on that. So that's where a lot of the anger comes from. But liberals can be just as angry. I mean, I've never seen such anger as I get when I say something that makes the folks on the far left get all exercised. And, you know, if you don't believe it, go to the Huffington Post and just read the comments or any of the liberal blogs and, and its daily coasts. Some of those are just, it's vicious. So it's, it's true of both sides. People on the far right, people on the left can both be just absolutely savage when it comes to dealing with people. How do you change that, though? You know, how do you change the climate? How do you make keep civil discourse from being an oxymoron? Uh, I think each of us have the responsibility. But come on. Well, no, but I, I, mean, I think it's gonna... a matter of modeling that. You know, I, my but show has become it, it... the most popular show on the weekend uh, of all cable news. And, uh, you know, I don't yell and scream at anybody. Now, I, I take very strong positions, but, but I, I have conversations and I bring people on that I don't agree with at all. I want to hear what they say. In fact, I have the view that if my views are really strong and I know what they are and why I believe them, uh, it, it's not going to affect me if somebody brings their best game to me and tells me what they stand for. I'm going to benefit from that. I'm not going to be uh, diminished and I want to know. Because if, if my view can be destroyed in a matter of a seven-minute conversation with somebody, it must not be a very solid view. Let me ask you another Twitter question. Lucy7, oh, sorry, Lucky7. Seven. See, <laughs> Lucky7. Seven. <laughs> Lucky7 asks, what does he, meaning you, uh -huh. mean when he says the Constitution should be more like the Bible? Well, I didn't say it quite like that. You actually here's said that I we said. should amend the Constitution to be in God's standard. Well, here's what I said. This was in the context of two issues, same-sex marriage and the right to life. And what I said was that it would be easier to change the Constitution, which by its design 
was created so it could be changed. And thank God we can change it. That's why we have the First Amendment. That's why we have the Second and the Third. And that's why women can vote. Uh, there are a whole lot of wonderful things that happened because we changed the Constitution. So it is a document that was designed so that it could be changed to better understand and better guarantee the basic rights of people. The Bible was not written so that we would constantly amend it and change it and adapt it to each culture. My point was, which was taken completely out of the context of the statement, that it would be easier to adjust the Constitution than it would be to adjust the Bible. And I still believe that. Um, what about gay marriage? I'm just, I know that you support a constitutional amendment defining marriage as only between a man and a woman, other than your religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. why, why are you so against gay marriage? It's not that I'm against gay marriage, it's that I'm for traditional marriage. And really, when I say traditional marriage, it would be better to say just I'm for marriage. Marriage doesn't mean any and everything we want it to mean. In all the recorded years of human history, it has only meant one thing. It has meant a man and a woman relationship that not only created the next generation, but that trained the next generation to be their replacements. It's not just the matter of the biological reproduction, however. It's the context in which children are able to grow up understanding the role models that both the male and the female provide. Every study, again, objectively, every study shows that children uh, are best um, perhaps developed when they when they see healthy male and female figures. And it doesn't mean that you have these arbitrary, you know, the man is the head of the house, the woman is this. It's a matter that there are characteristics and qualities that each gender bring that are healthy and noble. Now, can a child grow up healthy and strong and, and uh, completely capable of anything in a single parent home? Absolutely. My own wife grew up in a single parent home. So many children do, and they do well. But I'm just saying, statistically, children need, ideally, a mom and a dad to give them that balance and to let them see what the, the processes of life are about. Rather than start a new form of marriage, I'd just like to see us do a better job with the form that we've, uh, we've had all these years. Arkansas State Rep Kathy Webb, who's a Democrat from Little Rock, mm -hmm. you know her. She's openly gay, and she said, you don't... Mike Huck Huckabee, quote, doesn't seem to have a whole lot of tolerance and goodwill toward gay people. Oh, I, I would, I'm very disappointed to hear that because I, I think it's not a matter of tolerance and goodwill. I, I just happen to disagree on the idea of changing marriage. I could argue that people who want to change marriage are angry at me because I want to keep it like it is. I, I don't think it has to be a personal uh, point of anger. I think it's a matter of do you think that marriage means what it has always meant? And if we do say we can change it, then who gives anyone the right to change it? And if we change it, how, how much can we change it? Can we change it to multiple spouses? If not, why not? You know, I hear people say, well, well, what would be wrong? What would be wrong then with a man having two or three or six or seven wives or a woman having six or seven husbands all at the same time, other than the financial challenge of, of doing that? But, I mean, seriously, once you change marriage, once you decide that it can be changed, then there is really no limit because if I said, well, that's different, why is it different? It's not different. If, if enough people believe that we should have, I'll just use the illustration of polygamy, then we should accommodate that. Otherwise, are we being just as bigoted and intolerant and lacking compassion because we don't uh, promote and accept and, and uh, put a sanction on, on polygamy? I don't think so. Finally, they're going to yell at me oh. because they're, they're telling me to wrap it up. But I, okay. I, I think this is important because, you know, this is the season for sure. Thanksgiving. 49 million Americans were in danger of going hungry in mm. 2008, which is such a shocking number. More than 4 million children in this country, 4 million children did not get enough to eat. You say you believe in government taking a role in, mm. in our society to help those I, I'm putting words in your mouth, mouth, but I'm assuming that that are underserved or mm -hmm. people in this category. What what can the government do? Um, you know, because boy, this is going to increase the deficit yeah. too, isn't it, Governor? You know, I think that, for, for example, our food stamp program has helped a lot of families. Now, but, it's not but a stamp not anymore. enough, clearly. Well, no, but you know, I'm part of a church that feeds more people than any other social entity in all of Arkansas. We we not only feed thousands of people at holiday. But every week, we put 600 backpacks on kids on Friday. 
and send those backpacks filled with food home so a kid doesn't have to have the embarrassment of picking up groceries. Just carries a backpack, but it's filled with food. Brings the backpack back Monday, empty, and next Friday we'll fill it back up. Then why aren't we doing a better job? You know, you mentioned that mm -hmm. program, but still, I mean, the statistics are, are jumping out. A off lot of this it has page. to do with each of us as individuals. I think we have responsibility to give more. If we're blessed, I mean, but do you it's think the government should should be doing more? The government's the last resort. I mean, but is the government better than a kid going hungry? You bet it is, and that's why I would say to my conservative brothers, you know what? We need to give more. We need to get involved in our churches and in our social organizations, and make sure that kids don't go hungry. I, I tell people that if if I'm really consistent about being pro-life, and I am. I can't just love that kid's life while it's in the womb, and then when it comes out of the womb, then suddenly I say, oh, it's okay, he's on his own now. Pro-life has to mean I'm just as interested in that child, not only in the eighth month of gestation, but I'm equally interested when he's eight years old and he doesn't have food tonight or he's getting the daylights whacked out of him by an abusive parent. And if, if there's not consistency, then I don't think I'm really pro-life. So it's, it starts with me personally, in my own income, and I have to give away income to make sure that I'm helping to personally fund that feeding program in our church. And I could say, go, call my pastor and ask him. Uh, I and, believe you. you okay. Don't need, I don't but my to call point your being pastor. is that I can't ask other people to chip in. See, what bothers me most, Katie, is when people say that they really are compassionate, but they're compassionate with somebody else's money. That's not compassion. If I'm compassionate with my money, that's one thing. But if I think you should give, and I'm not necessarily giving, but I think you should give, and I'm starting to tell you, what you how much you should give out of your check, that isn't compassion. That's coercion. And compassion ought to operate because we genuinely feel a personal responsibility to help the people around us in our neighborhood and our communities who have less. What are you most thankful for? My family. That's an easy one. I'm very thankful. I have uh, a wife that is alive that, uh, quite frankly, as I look back, um, you know, 1975, 34 years ago, I wasn't sure we would celebrate another year together. And, and I know you've been through the heartbreak of, of, of the incredible loss of a spouse. I have three children that doctors told us we'd never have. They said we couldn't have kids because of the radiation therapy that Janet had when she was uh, getting over the cancer. And uh, one's 32, one's 29, one's 27. You know, those are all precious gifts to me. And I'm grateful for, for having a family that... Uh, that I'll be able to spend the holiday with. Well, Governor Mike Huckabee, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you, It's Katie. always fun to talk to you. Your latest thanks. book is called A Simple Christmas, 12 Stories That Celebrate the True Holiday Spirit. Really thanks. enjoyed talking to you. Thanks so much. And you can check, uh, of course, Governor Huckabee out on TV as well on his Fox News show just called Huckabee. What a clever title. Very How did you come original. up with that? Very original. <laughs> anyway, now stay tuned <laughs> for a message from our sponsor, Dove.